Speaking of Darwin, how do, Dar how do evolutionists uh, tell us that dinosaurs have become birds? Well, they say it all happened by random chance through random mutations and natural selection. It started out with a dinosaur at the bottom, like you're seeing in the picture here. And this wasn't just any kind of dinosaur, it's the kind of dinosaurs that walk around on two legs, the theropod. You see the word there, theropod dinosaurs. Unfortunately, remember, the theropod dinosaurs are not the ones with the bird hip, they have the lizard hip. Not that the bird hip looks that much like a bird anyway. And by the way, uh, can you see the knee okay? Is that showing up for you, the knee there? And uh, notice it's a small theropod dinosaur. Uh, some theropod dinosaurs are much bigger. In fact, everybody's favorite dinosaur, at least among kids, is the T-Rex. And the T-Rex is a, a theropod dinosaur. They say they were so nasty, even their own moms didn't like them. <laughs> But uh, walks on two legs, balances from his hip, not from his knee. You have no trouble seeing dinosaur knees. But can you imagine what it would take to convince yourself that that thing you're looking at right there is a close relative of a hummingbird? The swift is a close relative of the hummingbird. There are roughly 300 species of hummingbirds in the family Trachelidae, which is only one of about a half dozen other families within the taxonomic order Apodiformes. Now, most of them are extinct, known only from fossils, because more varieties of life have gone extinct than we still have today. But we do still have about 100 species of swift. Would you creationists agree that swifts and hummingbirds are closely related? Pushing a bit further up the taxonomic tree of life, we see that hummingbirds, swifts, and nightjars are all striceries though that would be pushing the limits on what we can call close relatives. I would ask whether creationists accept that the swift or nightjar is biologically related to the hummingbird, but I already know that creationists don't like to answer the phylogeny challenge because you can't, and you already know why you can't. Striceries are one of a few subclades of neoaves, itself one of a few different clades within neonates, a parent category representing every living bird species you've ever heard of, except for ostriches and emus and such from their sister group, paleonates. Together, these two now very distantly related groups represent neornates, the only clade of birds to survive the KT extinction event that killed off all of the other dinosaurs. The entire aviary, every bird species there ever was, emerged from within the clade of aviale. Aves, also known as birds, are just one of a few sets of paraves, which includes a few different sets of bird-like dinosaurs apart from birds. Paraves are just one of a few sets of Maneraptor and dinosaurs themselves, one of a few larger clades of Silurosaurs that also include Tyrannosaurs. There are a few different species of Tyrannosaurs, too, some that are known to have had feathers, but they are much too far removed to be considered close relatives of even the earliest bird species. Do you understand that now? I'm not capable of it. I, I lack the credulity. It's not possible. You have credulity enough to believe in Noah's Ark and in the Tower of Babel. You're credulous enough to believe that a man lived for three days underwater inside of the fish that swallowed him whole. And you're foolish enough to believe that the sun stopped in the sky and that snakes can talk and that magically enchanted fruit can bestow knowledge. All those things are impossible. But the evident reality that big animals are related to small or similar ones of the same taxonomic clade is not only possible, it's a verifiable and, as you've just seen, indisputable fact. What is a dinosaur anyway? Dinosaurs have been known for a long time before 1841, but in 1841, an uh, English anatomist, Sir Richard Owen, was the first to really describe what was unique about a dinosaur. And that is dinosaurs were the only reptiles that walked on top of their legs the way we do. You might say, well, where do the other reptiles walk? Uh, they're like this uh, lizard you see in the middle here. Elbows out, knees out, belly draggers. So uh, only the uh, dinosaur walks straight on top of its legs. Look at the other. These are the four orders of living reptiles, and they're all belly draggers. They don't walk on top of their legs like a dinosaur. The crocodiles walk that way. Uh, the lizards, of course, the snakes, uh, they don't have legs at all. Uh, testudines are the turtles and tortoises and what have you. And uh, finally, Sphenodontia is an interesting one. It's a living fossil. Uh, we see them in the fossil record, and uh, evolutionists say that they're 200 million years old, the ones we see in the fossil record. 
Yet today we have the very same looking creature, at least as far as we can tell, doesn't appear to have evolved or gone anywhere, and there's only one species. I don't know what Dr. Menton is crowing about. Rhynchocephalians were an order of three-eyed lizard-like lepidosaurs that were plentiful throughout the Mesozoic era of dinosaurs with dozens of genera containing multiple species each, known from around the world of the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous strata. They were as diverse in their time as typical lizards are today, but only sphenodonts survived the KT extinction isolated in the islands of New Zealand. Similarly, there were once many different groups of egg-laying mammals in the Mesozoic, and only three species remain today. The last of those other taxonomic orders was a collection of mostly rodent-like multi-tuberculates that only made it as far as the Oligocene. Because species, like our own for example, sometimes thin out until there's only one left. It's like humans, there's only one species of humans. We don't have several species of humans, there's only one species of Spenodontia. They say there's two subspecies, but they're capable of interbreeding. Anyway, uh, this is one of the early uh, finds, very exciting to evolutionists, just a year or two after Darwin published The Origin of Species. Uh, in 1860, they discovered uh, Archaeopteryx. Uh, it was found in Bavaria, and uh, again, using the sort of dates evolution has come up with, it was supposed to be 140 million years old. That makes it as old as most dinosaurs are, certainly. And uh, people argued over whether it was a bird or a, a dinosaur. I, I've said that uh, one way to identify whether something is a transitional species is when people can't agree which side of the arbitrary imaginary line that it is 100% on that one or this one. So there's a number of species where people will argue that X example is 100% this or 100% that, but they'll never admit that it's a transitional, even when there's disagreement on which side of that line it should be on. Like with Archaeopteryx, I would not describe that as a bird. That's that's dinosaur. If you're going to divide the birds and dinosaurs at all, then, then the Archaeopteryx would be on the dinosaur side, not the bird side. And of course, this was very interesting because evolutionists were looking for transitional forms, something going from A to B. And this seemed to be it. It definitely had feathers. There's no arguing about that. If you look here, uh, feathers on the wing here and up here, and look at all these feathers on the tail, and look how long the tail is. That really threw people. They said, birds have a little short tail. Archaeopteryx has a long tail, therefore it's really kind of a dinosaur. Now, Sir Richard Owen, the anatomist I told you about that discovered uh, or gave dinosaurs their name, he said that it was unequivocally a bird. And others, there were others who agreed with him. But Thomas Huxley, he was Darwin's big defender, often called Darwin's bulldog. He said that it's clearly a feathered dinosaur, and he said it's a dead ringer for another dinosaur by the name of Compsognathus. Well, let's just take a look at Compsognathus. Look at the tail. All those vertebrae in that tail have these long spines, dorsal uh, processes here and ventral processes called hemal arches. They have transverse processes. This is all muscle and ligaments and tendons here. This is a heavy, powerful tail like you'd see uh, on an alligator. Whereas the tail on Archaeopteryx, the feathers went right in and attached to the bone uh, that formed the core of the tail. Uh, and these bones here were all fused to one another, so this would have behaved like a stick, uh, not like a whip, like an alligator tail, but more like a stick. So, no, Compsognathus could not be confused. And Compsognathus had pubic bones that faced the front. Uh, and uh, these are the ischial bones that are in the back here. And it would have balanced from the hip because it had as much weight behind as in front. Well, that's the way Compsognathus uh, would look compared to a chicken, to a large rooster. And as, again, you can see the knees. Thing you've illustrated is that there's more diversity within birds than between birds and dinosaurs, and there's more diversity within dinosaurs than between them and birds. And, and you mentioned the tail also, and, and so did he when he was arguing that uh, one of the reasons that you couldn't compare Archaeopteryx to Compsognathus was because Archaeopteryx's tail was rigid and couldn't be used like a whip. Yeah, so Compsognathus also had a rigid tail, did it not? Yeah, uh, again, this is, uh, if you look at the diversity of predatory dinosaurs, there's a subgroup within 
within theropods that have got a stiffened end half of the tail. And they're called the tetaneurans. That name actually means stiff tails. And this group includes allosaurs, tyrannosaurs, and all the, the, the manoraptorans, in, in, including, including the birds. They have a much stiffer tail than, than other, other kinds of theropods, which didn't have this tail stiffening stuff in, in, in the end half, is once you get in manoraptorans, the number of tail vertebrae decreases, the tail overall becomes uh, stiffer. So that the tail of like Velociraptor and Archaeopteryx would be stiffer and shorter and shallower than that of Compsognathus. But the tail of Compsognathus is also shorter and stiffer and shallower than that of another kind of theropod, like, you know, a Ceratosaurus or a Coelophysis, an animal that's outside of this particular subset of theropod. We used to think that we'd never find very many fossil birds, but boy, has that story changed. Over the last 20 or 30 years or so, in the northeastern part of China, in an area called Liaoning Province, right near North Korea there, they found 60 species of plants, 300 species of invertebrates, and 90 species of vertebrates, including amphibians, uh, reptiles, birds, mammals, and... Uh, lots of fossil birds. In fact, the most common vertebrate in Liaoning province is this one right here. It's called Confuciornis sanctus, uh, and it is supposed to be 125 million years old. I don't accept those days. This bird has every single feature we would see in a modern bird. That would include a crop, a syrinx, you name it. It even has some specialized tail feathers that sort of remind me of a, a, a forktail uh, flycatcher. So feathers, every part of the body, crop, gizzard, you name it, it's got it. And it's a bird. Here's 130 million, again, I don't accept these days, 130 million year old bird that was found in that area recently. And uh, it's uh, Archae ornithera. And again, it has every component we would reasonably expect to find uh, in a bird, including feathers. I mean, I, I really like the point that if you could travel in time and you went back to the early Cretaceous or the Jurassic 100 million years ago, 150 million years ago, you know, that kind of time frame, and you wander around and saw an assortment of dinosaurs that were, say, smaller than, you know, human sized, you would see various duck sized, crow sized, pigeon sized, feathered dinosaurs you wouldn't be able to confidently point to one and say that one is the bird and that's the one that's going to give rise to a dynasty of tens of thousands of species that will outlive all the others here because what we now understand about the anatomy the life appearance you know the feathering and everything of the velociraptor group the truodontids the overraptors um they were uh, they were so incredibly similar to early birds that to claim that you can mark birds, carve birds out as one totally separate group, unlike dinosaurs, I mean, it is, is false. And it, it's part of the reason why I think it's crucial to always point out that, you know, not only are, dinosaurs are not extinct, but this major group of, of dinosaurs survived and birds are dinosaurs. They are not distinct once you get back to animals like Archaeopteryx, you would not be able to distinguish them. And in fact, in these big phylogenetic studies that you know are, are, are pretty standard uh, in vertebrate paleontology, um, we we find you know a, a number of species that move branches from one study to the next. Even Archaeopteryx itself, you know, sometimes it's on the branch that includes living birds and doesn't include velociraptor and oviraptor and whatnot and other times it is other times you know the the particular characters we analyze um will cause it to you know hop hop a branch or two these animals move around which isn't a surprise given how given how similar they are it's exactly what you expect uh, given you know how similar they are and the fact that evolution is true